Welcome everybody to Gallery Gallery. I'm Rens Kools and I'm the artist behind this initiative. Um, Gallery Gallery debuted in 2012 as a platform for emerging artists through curated online exhibitions and live feeds of performances. Initially leading a nomadic life, Gallery Gallery established a foothold here in Antwerp in 2018. And the non-profit artist-run curatorial project organizes short-term events focused on post conceptual art. Our discussion tonight, why are we still painting? I'm just going to start by introducing our four speakers. The members of the panel this evening are, on my immediate right, yeah. there is Johanna Christbjörg Sigurd Dardotir. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, really good. Thank you. <laughs> She's an Icelandic artist living in Antwerp. Her works are built on combinations of forms and color as visual language that creates relationship and connections between paintings and sculptures, where she deals with surface in space. Therefore, her works can be seen more two-dimensional. There is a kind of physical rhythm and mindful frequency in her works, based on a formal language that she uses and can also be seen as an abstract manifestation of poetic expression. Yeah. Johanna holds a postgraduate from HISC, that's the Higher Institute for Fine Arts in Ghent, and she currently teaches at the installation department at Kask in Ghent. Yeah, thank you. Next to Johanna is Michiel Keulers. Michiel Keulers lives and works in Brussels. His practice relentlessly claims its place in a long tradition of painting, but does so by questioning that tradition and the relationship of the still young artist to it. Keulers' work are not answers, but hypothesis in which various influences, materials, and stylistic features meet. Although Curls is best known for his abstract paintings, his practice is built upon a trajectory from figuration to abstraction and back again, in which the reoccurring intentions to renew the medium from the core of its oeuvre. Curls graduated from the Rijksakademie van Beelden Kunst Amsterdam in the Netherlands in 2011. Well, 2012. Yeah and is represented by Nicolin Gallery in Los Angeles. On my left is Mathieu Verhagen. Mathieu Verhagen is a visual artist living, in, living and working here in Antwerp. He holds a Master in Philosophy from the University of Antwerp and a Master of Visual Arts from the Royal Academy of Fine Arts, also here in Antwerp. And he builds his artistic practice around the dialogue between existentialism, art and humor. His approach spans from a variety of media, including sculpture, collage, multiples, and installations. Yet it is painting that holds a central position. Memories, images, and the way in which they resonate with the unconscious nourish the artist's imaginary, simultaneously revealing a profound interest in the space between the sculptural and the painterly. In his ongoing series of sausage paintings, the concept of life, death, and entropy are both subject and material. Through the seemingly simple filling of pork intestine with paint, his work questions and or reveals the very inner nature of painting. Inevitably also expanding on the idea of its death, so often proclaimed in art history, in a playful yet witty manner. Verhaar's work is also part of the seed collection at Mucca in Antwerp since 2021. Then next to Mathieu is Melissa Gordon. Melissa Gordon is American and British artist based in Brussels. Her painting practice, which is concerned with the histories and behaviors of gesture, incorporates silk screen, ready mates, writing, and publishing. Melissa Gordon has a current solo exhibition, Liquid Gestures, at the Towner Gallery in the UK. And recent publications of writing include Funny Peculiar and The Embarrassment of Success. Yeah. And she's also a professor of painting at Oslo Art Academy in Norway. So, this is our panel for this evening. Uh, please give them all a warm welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so, our discussion tonight. Why are we still painting? So, I'm going to start by posing the question and then pose it to Melissa Gordon initially. So, Melissa, why do you think artists continue to paint? Why are we still painting? 
Great. Um, can you hear me? Um, I can't wait to see the sausage paintings. Uh, I'm very <laughs> excited about those. Um, so I wrote a quick, I hope, five minute, um, and I thought this might be interesting to start with some context. Because when you uh, called me, I immediately actually thought about the um, Jan Verwert essay, Why Are Conceptual Artists Painting? Again, from 2007, and then the next line is Because They Want To. Um, so I thought it's maybe interesting to go back to this thing, which is about 15 years old. So I took a few quotes from it, and I'm doing a, just a very quick rundown. So um, a, one quote from that is the, from Verwert. He says, the conflict between a conceptual and a medium-specific understanding of artistic practice only becomes comprehensible or understandable in all its intensity and depth of meaning when it is viewed not pragmatically but historically. So in this essay, Verwert sets up a conflict between a medium-based pursuit of contemporary and historic painting versus conceptually driven development of art objects, which might or might not include painterly concerns. So he says either we view painting as something that only pertains to its medium, or we view painting as something that can arise out of any conceptually driven um, sort of pursuit. But then as an update maybe to the Verwert essay, I was also thinking about, there's a David Yozlet essay called On Aggregators, which was written in 2014. And in that text in October magazine, and he proposes this idea that we are actually all living in basically the international style of, instead of the avant-garde of conceptualism, that we are all sort of like repeating um, the avant-garde gestures of conceptualism, um, such as document, proof, and instruction. Um, and that this is sort of like a like a constraining force on contemporary art. And he proposes the aggregate, like um, Slavs and Tartars or Eflux, like these as like forms of authorship as a way out. But um, Yazalit is not necessarily pointing to a division in the motivation of painting. He's pointing towards the fact that the gestures that exist behind artworks, medium specific or not, need a change or something like a way out. So, um, and I'll. I'm, I, this is not much longer. I believe that we're firmly beyond post-medium. Why? Not because painting is having a resurgence and not because just anyone can paint, regardless of the cynical or practical attempts of numerous artists to engage suddenly in painting after filmic, sculptural, and conceptual practices, because why can't their subjectivities also bleed out um, into any medium? I would argue that one, when one speaks in painting, which I think all we all speak when we are painting, um, one speaks to a history of gestures, and then the question is, who, who do those gestures, who decides which gestures speak? Um, so when I say gesture, I just want to like clarify what I mean, is that I, I think that gesture itself has agency, that gesture, when we think about gesture, it's the thing that actually moves between the act and the understanding of the act. Gesture is the thing that shows us how to imagine that something has happened. So it's like the firelight flickering to animate cave paintings or film stills coming together or like myths of Greece, Greek statues coming to life. It's like gestures like the enactment of um, an idea or an action, but that we see it happening. Um, so I think there's many reasons why people are painting now. One, I would say people paint because it makes them feel good, like taking photos and hoping that people like it. Another reason, I think, could be about making images and responding to images that arise from the past, like a reinscription into history um, and with history. And then just to give that some context, also in that Verwert uh, text, he, he quotes Brian O'Doherty. Um, I can't remember which essay. He says, quote, I suppose the formal content of a gesture lies in its aptness, economy, and grace. And so O'Doherty is talking about that sort of gestures. They come, they go, they reappear they resurface and they become re-relevant. And I think that's like very important right now. And then there are some of us doing this, um, and this is why I paint, um, because of a complete inability to language, because nothing is clear, nothing makes sense, because a total and sheer impossibility to understand how, why, and what for um, at all. Um, and then I'll end with a quote um, from a uh, Giorgio Agamben, in which he talks about this notion of the gag. It's a, it's a quote from the essay um, uh, Notes on Gesture. He says, however, because being in language is not something that could be said in sentences, the gesture is essentially always a gesture of not being able to figure something out in language. It is always a gag in the proper sense of the term, which 
indicates, first of all, something that could be put in your mouth to hinder speech, as well as the sense of the actor's improvisation meant to compensate a loss of memory or inability to speak. So I think there's also this idea that maybe people are painting because they don't know how to say it in another way. Yeah. That they feel it's their only way to ex express themselves is through painting. It can't be expressed in language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, maybe just for art in overall, not just painting, but I think uh, it's a platform to express and yeah, what you cannot say or also in sculpture. Like, yeah. No? Mm -hmm. Maybe, it's yeah. Like a... Maybe. Or also just to feel good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Because. I don't know, like, because you have different aspects and you as well of your practice, so you can also, like, look from the other point, what, what's the difference between, like, sculpture and a painterly object? But for me, I, I think also, um, what I think is really interesting is also the agency and the kind of quickness that arrives in, in, the, in the act of painting. Because for me, it's always in, interesting, like, the friction that happens with... Uh, plasticity of painting and then the reflection that follows because in a sense they don't really correlate because it's a, a different moment. You act, you respond, you drop, you, you're clumsy and suddenly it can generate a picture but then it's your mind who has to work around it. So it's for me it's always the interesting aspect of it. It's kind of like through painting I can discover aspects of me that I couldn't see otherwise. So for me like painting kind of like, I don't think it's another idea of language because mm. I don't think, I mean, they sometimes say like as, like in Dutch, it's, it's a sentence as stupid as a painter. Mm. And I think it's not, I think the stupid, like stom, really arises from that idea of being mute. Yes. Because it's a mute language. Mm -hmm. I do <laughs> think it's a language. It's not a vocal language and it's not a straightforward language. But I think the relevance of painting, and I think it will always be the relevance of painting, that it's about language, and language adapts. Words enter in the lexicon and move out. And I think in those kind of things that painting still has a relevancy. I mean, the whole idea of like the death of painting, because I was uh, taught in Ghent, and uh, one of my taught tutors was often dis going into that kind of discussion. I think it's in a sense a beautiful thing that it was like knocked out of his pedestal that it's no longer like the force that it was because in a sense like uh, the crisis of painting and photography propelled the whole agency of the avant-garde yeah. now it's just one of the plural yeah mm -hmm. yeah and to come back to what you said uh, the first thing i wanted to talk about was actually physicality so mm -hmm. it makes complete sense for me that um that it's um, a way to understand yourself in being in the world. That it's that it's that is not uh, describable with words. Or mm. um, I think the the reason I started um, being involved in art is just that because language drew short in a way. So that was the first thing on my paper here. So. Yeah. I think that's a very essential part of painting. It's, it's just that it's a physical way of being and that physicality in our practice is something we start from. So that's the very fundamentals for me, I think. But is it then an extent to language? Or is it something that I, can I, takes over language? I think or it's a it language on its own. Next but to it, or is it that's a semantic question, I think. Uh, so it's a, like a semantic discussion, but I think it's a language on its own in the way that if language is a means to understand your surroundings or how you are in the world, then it's a language that has its own quality or its own um, status. Mm. Or yeah, and language has been developed to describe moves in painting, like formlessness. Or like the or flatbed, which means like painting flat, and but all these or um, I don't know uh, action or you know, but all of these things I think actually fall short of 
what a history of gestures is. So like if you talk to painters, a lot of times they're like, oh, a picture and a picture. Or like when you say like, yeah, this sort of dumb thing that you do and then you have to figure out what, I don't even think there's a word for that. And I think that that's really great, but I know exactly what you're yeah. saying. But then I think also it's kind of interesting to think like, why now? <laughs> like why do these dumb things and still um, give them value or give them like interest and time? I mean, I don't, I think that's maybe too big I mean, of a question. But No, but that was maybe going to be my next question is that um, what I notice now from you is that it really is something for uh, that's, uh, personally, for you all, as as artists, as painters, important uh, to do in your studio um, to work with those gestures, with those, with that language. Um, but how do you, as painters today, look at the relevance of painting in today's art scene? I just actually want to come back to something that Melissa said. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of the dumb is really essential also for me. Because, yeah. I mean, a stupid idea can really resonate in a beautiful, intelligent painting. And I think, like, also that idea of, like, why do conceptual artists paint again? In a way, because they can be stupid. Yeah. I think that's a really big question. Because, like, sometimes the idea of, like, painting a blue square next to a red one is as mundane as can be, but it can result in the most beautiful painting. Mm. And I think that's also something that it's really, it doesn't have to do with intellect. It goes about visual ideas and strategies that are actually manifested within a canvas. And I think that's still the beauty of it. Or also embedded in like a history of having seen those things sort of in action before. Yes. Um, and then that's kind of interesting. That maybe goes back to your question, which is like, I think I think there's still like, quite a lot of space for other voices to come into the dialogue of painting. I think that's like for me a very exciting potential, like that there's all these sort of histories of painting that have not been sort of, I mean even like for example, I didn't see it but the Hilma of Clint um, work being put at the beginning of the woman um, in modernism show in Paris that was happening recently, which is kind of a problematic thing to do it's like she what was she really an abstract artist like that's questionable like was she really involved in the avant-garde of abstraction I don't know but then it's important that that becomes like parallel yeah so for me that's exciting and then also talking about your question also looking at contemporary painters mm -hmm. I mean in preparation of this discussion I was also looking back on the uh, the themes that were being discussed in the Fischli show oh, yeah. in Venice that had the title uh, Stop Painting. And therein, I actually wrote it down. He had like five uh, moments of crisis. So the first is like uh, the invention of photography. Then it's the collage and the ready-made. Then it's the death of the author. Then it's also like uh, the idea of the commodification. Then you have the avant-garde. And I was just discussing that maybe the, the new idea of a new crisis is that there's maybe no crisis anymore. <laughs> And that there's no, in that kind of sense, no real agency to respond to. Yeah. So maybe, and that's like sometimes if I look to younger painters, that the way of like spreading the work is sometimes easy, a bit too easy in a way. And maybe that's also because Would I grew up with that kind of like voice in the back of like, and that kind of inherent sense of the death of a painting. Yeah. So it's, it's a question that I have. But it's also a way that I sometimes look at other younger painters. Yeah. So the question you have about younger painters is that there's, in their eyes, no uh, real um, crisis in painting anymore, and that, that that's where they found their new like um, uh, freedom to go and paint. The distribution networks are changing, that's for sure, but for all painters... And, yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe in, in a way the, the question why isn't posed anymore. I think, so. that's old the, the, I think that's what <laughs> you're trying to, to... Yeah, no, in a way, I mean, that was the kind of question how you kind of look to another generation. Mm. But it's also because then what we're discussing about, like, the idea of language and, like, how you are also being taught and, like, how to look at certain things and questions. And the whole idea, I mean of the problem of, of a painting was quite essential like when I was in the formation of an academy. 
even though I, I didn't grow up in the 90s and everything. So I didn't like personally uh, ex- experience that dialogue. You still had it like as a kind of wave because your teachers had that experience. So it's kind of like that. And I kind of have the feeling that some of the younger artists working today in the field of painting didn't really have that question or didn't really propose an answer on it. Yeah, that would be a good thing maybe to point out now is that uh, we were just discussing this before, before we started to talk, is that um, you're all from the 80s, yeah, all four yes. of you. So that was like this uh, <laughs> funny coincidence that I was trying and look uh, and, and uh, found to find someone maybe from like an older generation to say so, but they were all a bit hesitant to do so, I think, uh, because maybe they were tired of, of like trying and defend their point and they would just want to be left alone. And it was also difficult to find the younger generation because maybe they're not experienced enough to talk about it. And, or maybe it's because what you were just posing is that maybe they don't even ask that question. That maybe they're not even wondering about why they're doing it. They're just doing it. Is that what you're saying? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It was just a proposition. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm not sure why or what's the case for the younger artists because I'm <coughs> you're not yeah. I'm not so mm-hmm. um, I think there's lots of great younger painters you know and I think there's lots of bad older painters too, yeah of so. course yeah, yeah but it doesn't have to do with yeah. good or bad I yeah think. but then but then I think what's interesting is like um, I, when you were talking it reminded me of when I actually studied um, I studied for six months in New York and I had a teacher who was saying like it was Jacqueline Humphreys and she was like you go to these eight shows every week and when I when you started doing that, it was like there was so much style. There was so much about style, and so I, rem- I mean, I, and actually, when I think about now and all these distribution networks like Instagram or all, and like you know, people, and I think like actually, we're still engaged in this like pretty like ex- expansive search for, and there's maybe multiple styles. So like in New York, it would be like okay, there's certain sort of like neo-realistic um, graphic-y things happening now, and then everyone would go like, why? Why is this happening? And then six months later, it would be uh, something else, you know. And yeah. and I remember that sort of really, yeah. That's something I would like to pick up on this 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 uh, distribution networks you were talking about. Like you said, for example, Instagram. What do you uh, think about the? Um, do you think that those kind of new networks made a difference in what painting is? Uh, do, do you, you think, think it? changed even painting itself or is it just mm. does it serve the painting or yeah. do you think it's even maybe even changed what painting is i think in in the first place it changes the way we look at paintings for sure so um i think we lose a kind of sense of slowness which was which is also like uh, int- intrinsically uh part of painting because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, it's different to see a painting on your mobile than it is in real life but I can know I don't know what the implications are of that uh, uh, yet but I think that's one of the main things that's changing now yeah that we yeah. consume it differently mm-hmm. well, that's for sure young people today will also have their own Problem. It's like there is always a problem. We will always have to be in a dialogue with mm-hmm. what's happening in the society. Maybe like they are, yeah, for sure they have their own thing now. But I mean, stylistically, and I mean, that's something that I noticed and I I'm never proved that was the case. But also because I think of the screen and the flatness of it, I saw a real reemergence and an interest in the idea of spray painting. Yeah. Uh, just with guns, um, what's the other one? Airbrush. Airbrush, like really like painting that really goes for the flatness again. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that within yeah. an image. And also like I can talk about my own experience. Around 2015, I was making uh, abstract paintings. You all had this inv- in market interest in it, what they were calling crabstraction or oh, awesome. uh, zombie formalism. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's also like how the speed of things were going. So I... And, I kind of also sometimes had the feeling that a lot of like the market interest was based on the kind of likes that yeah. a painting could get. So 
I mean, because the, the idea, like painting being reduced to something flat to a JPEG, is something that kind of yeah. happened. So totally. I mean, it's also something that we kind of saw the problem arise during the COVID crisis: is how to articulate the object of a painting within a viewing room setting. So that's like a kind of like thing that kind of I found problematic. And then my personal response nowadays, like I often work with glitter or like with mirrors within the paintings to kind of like in a way object to that notion of the documentation because in a way like, yeah, it's, it's so easy. It's almost like, yeah, swapping to Tinder sometimes, <laughs> like going to the... So, it is like, Tinder for painting. <laughs> yeah, it is really like that. So it's, uh, yeah. that's something yeah. and I th- thought in a way that Oh, uh, the airbrush, but also like a lot of painting that deals with the idea of pixels or like uh, icons or like like sometimes you had like you know like the logos on your iPhone. Sometimes they went from spatial render to a graphic design, and you kind of had the feeling that like also in that kind of like painting you saw I recognized that. Yeah. In it. So it's that kind of distribution I think is totally different at the yeah. moment. I mean, I think I have like two sides. Like one thing is that I actually. I'm really not interested in social media, but I actually love the breadth of paint. Like, I love the breadth of things I can see on Instagram, like, as a... But I'm not into it. But I, you know, I love the exposure. But then on the other side, I feel like... uh, like, And also, I have, like, a student who actually now is, like, she's so good on Instagram that she shows me all these artists that I've never heard of, and I love that. Like, I love that I get to know Mm -hmm. things and that I get to see into things of shows that I can't go to and... You know, I'm a mom, so it's like I can't travel around the world, like, you know. Um, but then but then the other side is, like, on the other flip side, I had a friend come into the studio recently before I shipped a bunch of paintings out, and she um, w- is an artist but was involved in a graphic design, and then she sort of ta- started talking about them in graphic terms, and, like, my, my soul crumbled. You know, I was like, oh, my God, I never thought about this. But when things then start getting viewed, like, in that construct... I realized, like, oh, no, how can how can we still view them as paintings, like, still view them as, like, these messy, sloppy things that have, like, stretchers and, like, marks and bad things. And then, like, when that all gets erased into, like, something, then I think, like, oh, okay, well, how are we're missing something here? Like, we're yeah. actually missing something in the communication. Yeah. Which, unfortunately, happened to me in a studio visit. <laughs> <laughs> but... I think it's also the, I mean, I tried out art history for a year and then like they always talked about the idea of uh, archiving, that you have to wait a certain time to look at something. And I kind of also have that idea with like the whole acceleration through kind of like uh, Instagram and everything that you're kind of in a constant now so that there's no mode of reflection. So the whole idea of temporality kind of like is flattened out. So basically what's, but you said like the whole kind of thing, like you have to watch those eight painting painting shows in New York. Yeah, and they kind of make sense in New York because you have a history, local history and a context, and certain institutions, certain teachers. Suddenly, that kind of gets transplanted, transported to say like Antwerp or that and that, and so you kind of have those different warp images or styles mm. that come together, and I think that's also yeah. something. Yeah, that's true. Quite strange in mm. a way. And do you think that was sort of like an affective? I'm really curious to hear about I want the report from inside zombie formalism. Inside formalism? <laughs> because you were saying that people were saying what you were working on was was part of that. Yeah, I mean... I never I, had a problem with it. I thought it was really interesting and generative. I mean, like, for me, the, the, it allowed, it gave me opportunities, but at yeah. the same time, it's also where... Uh, the factorized that they were speculating and throwing yeah. my works on yeah. auction. That's so, a different thing, and isn't then it? Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. But, I mean, just l- l- if you saw uh, some of the art gossip, like people like Christian Rosa, yeah. who were like the biggest thing, and then like a year later, like two zeros of their prices were gone. Yeah. And now he's been like, the FBI is like looking for him because he didn't have other means of income anymore. So it's kind of like yeah. how fast that goes. And yeah. then now we're changing it for something else. So that's... Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Um, Back wanna, to, to the moderator. I want to talk now about something completely different. We, we talked about this, um, this um, 
distributing and, and the showing on, on <coughs> this new technology and how it maybe changes, um, I don't know, the way we paint or we look at uh, what painting is. But um, I want to come back to, uh, Mathieu, something you said, this slowness um, of painting and how that is like important to painting and that it's maybe a bit lost now with this uh, uh, fast technologies. But I want to talk about that um, in regarding to um, like the, the the process of painting, like in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, and I want, to, I want to ask the four of you, like how important for you is this, this work-like process, uh, like working in the studio, probably alone, no? Mm -hmm. So it still has this kind of romantic image to it, uh, painting. It's something rather slow. It takes time. So I don't know, maybe how does that work like process relates to this fast medium of scrolling through Instagram or something, or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But the first has to do with production and the second has to do with consumption of the artwork or, or precisely yeah yeah mm -hmm. so but for me personally there's still a big gap in between both so for me i i don't feel that much uh changing in my studio work because of instagram um because instagram is once your artwork is made you put it out in the world and then it's fueled by others but mm -hmm. but that's just personal for me it's or maybe it's it it is already unconsciously, but my process is still un, relatively unaffected by the social media. But but uh, um, um, if we if we don't take the, this new uh, technology in in um, if if we weren't to talk about that and we just were talking about like showing paintings in 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 shows in physicality. We just were to talk about that and how how important uh, for you personally is this this process of painting this the the putting in the work the, the slowness yeah, it's everything it. because I'm the I'm the artist so for me it's it's what what we do huh? yeah. yeah but why why is that something why is it something you you feel like comfortable in. Um. The slowness. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Cause you, no, I don't know. Maybe because I, I'm looking for a kind of depth in my life to understand things in a more profound way. That's why I, I started making art, actually. So. But you decided to make slow art. No, 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 but I think, slowly, but I think making painting is is a slow thinking process. No, yeah. I mean, if you compare it to other ways of, I also think painting expressing is, ourselves or, or yeah. thinking. So it's like more of a mental space or something. You're in a, another dialogue than when you do sculptures or physical. Like for me, at least, it's. A but maybe I'm just difference. assuming it's a slow but process. Eh? Maybe I don't not, think it's I don't necessarily no, a slow, 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 slow process. process. Me, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. think that's. A, no, I mean, for me. I mean, the, the time between actions can be slower because then you have the whole mental reflection. You almost staring back at yourself and trying, figure, trying to figure out what you did. But mostly when they ask me how long it took, I would say like three or four inter sessions of like half hour, 45 minutes. And then a lot yeah. of times just sitting there and wondering what, yeah. but what you did. that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I, I take in consideration the whole process, of course. Eh? So... I'm I'm not so quick at it, mm. but but there's also like the, I mean we all go well we don't go in every day because we don't necessarily have the time to do that but you know essentially like I think everybody has like this thing that happens pretty regularly like and then when it goes out is like totally irregular and that's maybe where that sort of dis I don't know like dissonance starts happening because it's like I think of myself as pretty darn busy every day but I might not have a show for two years and and frankly that's fine you know and then all of a sudden there might be a few things and people go oh you're so busy I'm like no I've been busy for 
every day for three years. Like, (laughs) that's what we all do, you know. And then, you know, the things that you've made, like, then find ways to talk to other things. And I think that, I think that's where I have the problem of, like, this expectation that you have to, like, or that, that... it happens not just on Instagram, it happens at universities, it happens with galleries, it happens in lots of different ways, right? Like these, all of a sudden someone, you know, these expectations happen. Of produ- producing or... Like, yeah, show me what you've been up to. And yeah. you're like, well, I can show you all this stuff. And yeah, yeah. some of it's ready, some of it's not ready, yeah. And Johan, how, how do you work in your studio? Yeah. Um, I... For you, it takes more time to no. I think I no. I I think I just stay in my studio and and yeah, do a little bit of something and try out other things and turn from painting to sculptures or play a little bit, listen to yeah. No, it depends on actually, but I don't think I'm a painter for one. I I'm a um, I, I'm more of a painter in a way that I, like, uh, for me, the sculptures and the paintings, and it's all just a layer. I think for me, the space, in a way, or how I put it, install it, that's like the frame. I'm, I'm more like, a, I think I, 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 of course, don't come from a painting, like, a, in Iceland, there was no uh, painting department when I did my BA. There we just do visual art, just for the, <laughs> what you want, or like you find out. Uh, yeah, so I'm not so, so I don't think I'm dedicated painter in a way. I just, it's just part of my, my work because I think with painting, I think I can create a extra space or something. So, so it's one layer of, uh, creating some kind of extra space for me, mental or like uh, with color. And then there are like sculpture, like it's, yeah, it comes together. Mm. So I don't work with only surface, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so <laughs> depends. I <laughs> Mostly I try to have fun or like I try to, yeah, free myself from, from stopping too much. So. It's tricky. It sounds relational, which is like, I think, yeah, part of every artist's practice. Yeah, it's, we all have our, I think. But that's what I mean by that it's a slow process. Like you, it, maybe you can finish artworks very, but formulating a sentence or a, yeah. something you want to say as an artist is something that's for me much slower than talking to you right now because now I just pour out my words and you don't pour out an exhibition or you don't pour out a I don't know maybe and I'm then why is that important sense. why is that important to take I the time to take it slow to formulate but I don't have a choice in that no, I yeah. feel myself so that's why I say it's personal I think every artist has yeah, you just right mind. back at the beginning that you're saying that it's something next to language that yeah, you, that's a means yeah. of, for you to express yourself is through, mm-hmm. through painting. And you don't feel you have any other ways of doing that as through that medium. That's maybe it mm-hmm. that I can understand from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it goes back to this thing of like when you... I, like, I literally have no idea if what I do each day is interesting at all. You know, yeah. and, that, you know it's, and then it takes like... I have to look at it and go, like, I think this is terrible, or maybe it's not. Yeah. I don't know. And yeah. then you have to develop the reasons as to why it is or isn't, which is like a, a separate logic. But is that even necessary to value it if it's... Uh, or like, do you do it and then, I don't know. Yeah, it's a question. Yeah, you fight with things like gimmick. Like, I fight with gimmick yeah, all the time. Yeah. Like, is it too jokey? Is it too gimmicky? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, and um, scale and... It's um, something I just uh, came up with now, but I was wondering in the middle of this talk, like maybe we should have started with um, what the definition of painting is. 
Or then uh, so people going like no, 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 no. Can open that, that to a wider. <laughs> wider. Uh, someone of you guys, I don't know, could try and formulate one, or do they think that they have one, or or maybe it would be interesting to hear all four of you their ideas about the definition of painting. Mathieu? Um, no, uh, I, I, I pass <laughs> on pass? this one. Yeah. So no, it's too. No, it's, it's it's too. Yeah. Too much. Uh, is it I, is it too hard to formulate? But you cannot do. I think it is it possible. No. I mean. Definition of painting. Like, no. Uh, how many point of views do we have there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like for me, like something that really interested me. I was living also a time in Germany, and there you have like two distinctions of like painting you mm. have malen yeah. und streichen yeah yeah and like malen is like the real like the ground thing like making a painting and like streichen is just applying paint yeah and sometimes like i don't know sometimes in the studio i i, I feel like that i'm more in that kind of second mode yeah and for me that's kind of interesting because yeah. i think in a way like it's maybe a way out for me but then like really i also like the idea like in english that painting is an object and an action Mm. as well so it's mm. it's those kind of things but if if that's a definition of painting then like for, for me they, these are things to think about and how to look at something because mm. but that's for all of us in a different way yeah, it's difficult to talk about huh? I, I think what he why, said but <laughs> yeah, but yeah it sounds, sounds once good you try to <laughs> thank it, you then it's but maybe it's, it's a hard to, to come up with this uh, general description of what painting is but maybe it's easier to describe what painting is for you personally? Or do you also pass on that question? There's things that are like concerns that surround it, right? That are problematic, like authorship is this thing that like circles painting and it's problematic. Like picture, like the notion of picture is problematic. Um, you know, um, the history of, of sort of like depiction um, you know, ma material thing that appears to be something else yet is just material, you know. Um, that idea of flatness, I think, is, like, wrapped up in that, you know. So, and then there's, like, fresco. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think there's, like, the portable painting and non-portable painting. I mean, do you know what I mean? Like, there's... Um, Expanded painting, but I mean, it's interesting because actually that's why contemporary painting is so like hard because there's no, you know, um, I don't know how to say like container that that feels like okay. Expanded painting, Michael Mujeres, you know, like or something, something's moving off the canvas. There's no like, yeah. yeah it reminds me of the yeah. film Gusson scraping off a painting and then trying to explain why he did it, and then. He says because it looked too much like a painting at a certain point. So that kind of indicates that it's very tricky to try to pinpoint what it actually means for an artist to... Because he says, like, I didn't exper experience anything through the process of making it. So, But even that's for him personally, yeah, but... So giving a definition of painting is like, I don't know if that's even a possibility. Yeah, I think it's very... That will make it yeah. easier for you or make it, I don't know, maybe even more harder. Is painting a process or is it a product? A process? It's both. I think also both. For me it's a process. Of course it's a product when you just take it out of the contents or something. Like if you say it... It's a, uh, but, yeah. Depends on what team you're on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What helmet you put on. Yes. Maybe it's a process in the studio and becomes a product in the exhibition space. Not, yeah. If someone is interested, maybe. then it's a... I guess it's also wrapped up in like what you envision like as an artist because I think a lot of people have like this idea of an audience in their head and that's actually like a really difficult thing because you might have this like ideal audience and then you are like alone <laughs> with, 
without that ideal audience and you have to come up. Do you know what I mean? Like you're like, oh man, people are going to love this. And then, you know, it's actually just you that's deciding that. So that's where I think that, that shift from process to product is like fantasy, like kind of your own fantasy that you enact for yourself, which is which is kind of like a funny mind game. Like that's sort of inaccurate. I, I mean, I'm making sort of fun of the role of the artist in a way. I don't mean to be that way, but yeah. it's interesting to think about that, um, you know, oftentimes you think it might enter into a lexicon or a conversation, but actually what you're left with is maybe a totally different conversation. Yeah. Or Yeah. I mean, I can also talk for myself when they like were speculating on my work at a certain moment, like the... You have tendencies and fashions that shift. And like I went from selling quite well to certainly nothing anymore. And for me, that, and that notion, I really felt free in a, in a sense. Because like you had the idea that it became back really like on the level of process and not on the product. Because you do, in a way, without wanting to admit it or not, sometimes work and stage paintings in a context of a dialogue you perceive. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's tricky, but like I really kn knew like, okay, I'm, I can make this shit because nobody will care for it anyway, yeah, exactly. but I did. There's a freedom, that's an amazing moment. And then <laughs> like I could really make shit, you know, like I could make things that nobody would ask the question of like, how will this, uh, yeah, stay like this? Like <laughs> how will this cookie on this painting stay like this? Like it's like, I mean, nobody like, was... I'm going to eat it. Oh. Yeah, so it's like, then it really became process again for me. When I, but that was just an experience that I had. Killed, killed the object in a way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Before we, we open up um, this talk to the audience, there's just um, one more thing I would like to talk about, and it's regarding this, this um, uh, product versus progress kind of way of thinking is uh, posing the question why are we still painting also immediately posing poses the question like why are we still making art I mean asking the one question is automatically also asking that other question because um, I really consider myself a conceptual artist and I work with um, a dematerialized practice so um, um, in preparation for this for this talk, um, I watched another talk from 2010, uh, which is called "The Trouble with Painting," mm. which can be found online. And there, um, the moderator David Torn tells, um, and I'm going to read it now: "A painting has become the commodity par excellence, a venal symbol of the commercial." degradation of art. The more sublime and or autonomous a painting, the more readily the wealthy buy it, reducing it to pure, pure wall decoration. It is elitist entertainment, a status symbol, an invest property. Everything except the sacred object it purports to be. So that will be um, my last question to you is like, um, is painting more than just is painting today is it more than just a marketable commodity yeah, um, yeah of course I mean I think yeah I think you know things <clears throat> there's always a sort of like in there's a I mean like Isabel Graw is like very interested in like how the market affects affects authorship in painting, right? And and um and I think what's actually kinda interesting, like I'm gonna I'm gonna like I'm gonna shift that like question because I think that's based on the notion that like the ready the notion of the ready made is is obsessed with market value. That the red like one one sort of enters into the history of the ready made and then painting enters into the history of the ready made when it becomes an object that it's that the ready made operates as something like a dialogue that engages in value but like if we if we actually and this is what I mean by like reinscribing gestures into history, if we like look back and maybe really take for take it that maybe Duchamp did not submit the fountain, that it was this other woman, Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven, and that in fact like 
um, perhaps the fountain was a political act and it was like a protest about gender and it was a protest against war and that rather than think, you know, do you know what I mean? So it's like this myth has been put on to these things like, but I think it's an angle and I think like there's other narratives, you know what I mean? That, And I don't think the narrative has to has to be that it's like, and because also the myth of the fountain is wrapped up like Duchamp, like he didn't... Um, he he um how do you say he editioned them in the early 60s and so basically like the fountain was submitted in 1917 there's like a 30 year gap where like nothing happened it didn't exist it wasn't part of art history but we have this myth that it was this moment that changed things it didn't he changed it in 1963 when he reinscribed it into the myth of modernism so it's like do you know what i mean like that i i think that there is i think the commodity also is a myth like it's a myth of inscription that happens at random times. Maybe at the moment that you're making it, maybe a hundred years later. Do you know what I mean? But I think it's definitely present, but it, it runs parallel, like, or, yeah, to me. Parallel with? Practice, yeah. It's like present. It's like the cha- It's like the train going next to you, but it might be going, like, far away or, like, crashing into you, you know, but I think it's not... Um, you're not always on that train, you know, like you might be on a donkey, you know, going <laughs> off the edge of a hill. <laughs> <laughs> At least, you know, I feel like that you. sometimes. <laughs> Any other remarks on that question? Because I still might have a few. No, I, I'm if we're talking about these new technologies and, and these new ways of looking at paintings, through um, um, through uh, new networks like Instagram, like we talked about before, then if it's if it's shared in that way to a broad audience, then why is it still important that there's still this physicality to that object? Why is it still important that a painting is a physical thing that can be um, well, that can be that can be put in the market. I mean, I think why it's important that it's a physical thing because we're physical beings. And for me, like I mean, there's also like that idea of discussion about the painterly surface as a skin, where I often object to. But it is, I mean, it it is a result of our humanity. Mm-hmm. The act of painting is describing you yourself onto a surface becomes that. So I think that idea of physicality of the object really becomes uh, imperative. And then um, also the idea of the unique is also something, because like we try to uh, be someone or something, so the idea of making it, you also want to create something new. I mean, that's the whole notion while we're sitting here also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Gra- <clears throat> Isabel Gra talks a lot about the idea that like the painting has this sort of life force. So it's like all of us when we make something, I guess. I mean, there's a in, there's a myth or a vision that like we dump or imbue our life into this object, and I think that's very present in mythologies. Um, and I think that sustains something. But I think we each have the possibilities to like interact with that still. And I think. I think uh, I don't. I can't. I, yeah. I wish I did have a opinion on how contemporary painting deals with that. I just know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what else to say. Like, I don't feel like I have an overview that can say like. But I'm not so sure about it. I'm not so sure about this sort of um, myth of this sort of like soul like dust that gets dumped on these things like I but because I think it I think it sort of also throws out the idea that like there's a long dialogue of moves and references and I don't know maybe they're not opposed I don't know like there's that great painting by um of Emile, Emile Zola by Manet have you ever seen that and it's like it he, Emile Zola is sitting at his desk and he has the printout of the Manet painting and then all these references to sort of his friendship with Manet and the painting is essentially like a document of their friendship, you know, uh, and their influences on each other. And it's, um, 
and it's like yeah it's fantastic actually but and now worth you know i mean now you know yeah well we have reached that point in the evening where we will open up for discussions so now who would like to ask a question yeah. Go. So, yeah the first question you asked was like why are you still painting and uh, I heard many answers, but they all went from uh, formalism, how you deal within your atelier, with your formal practice, how you change your transition, how you uh, reflect on what happened in the art world before you, uh, blah, blah. and uh, what I was missing was like, how do you deal with what happened around you outside of the atelier in the real world, talking about the zeitgeist, and uh, especially like, that we all come from Western countries without any problems. Uh, during our practice, and you never face the problem like a crisis or like isolation or loneliness or any of these things, and that you actually start thinking about why am I making work? What's the function within that, within the world? Uh, what am I bringing back? And I didn't hear any of those answers. It was all based on me in the atelier or like the transition with the, the media, how you portray your work in, in digital world, but nothing. You don't talk about the real things, and I was wondering. I've dealt with those three years of isolation, or did you question your, your yeah, everything that you do and the functionality of that? And that's what I wanted to hear with the title of this uh, uh, yeah. talk. Yeah. I have had that. There's exactly this. It's a, it's a good way to think also. But maybe every artist has that at some point, like where. What's, what are we... I mean, I feel like I'd have to do a whole artist yeah. talk, like to, to, but I, to like, describe how all the things I use, like, come from the world or don't, but I, I, yeah, of course things come from the world around. Yeah. But, I and mean, things change, uh, yeah. Yeah, as a just personal thing, for me, like also during the whole kind of COVID ordeal, I painted because it made me feel sane, in a sense. Like, that was the one continuation that I had. And, and as well, like, I suddenly had, like, a space and time to really work in. And also during this lockdown, um, I was, normally was going to happen already, like, a year or two years ago. I was working on a catalog of my work. So for me, it was also like a trip going back at certain stuff. But I... For me, the act of painting was also to deal with that. And I'm not saying that I, I didn't really address like big topics in my work, but for me, it was that just that notion of control. Because as, as a thing, like what I really found particular during this lockdown crisis is the idea of choice or something that's forced upon you. Because painting as a practice is already quite solitary. But often that's by choice, because you're then alone in the studio. But like when it becomes unforced of you, then it's like a whole different thing. And maybe you're the solitary the same amount of hours, but suddenly that becomes more threatening in a sense. So for me, it was really like the one thing that I could manage, my relationship to the canvas. And then I don't think that I had worldly implications for the rest of society, but as a person, as an artist, I felt the commitment and really also it um, enlarged my own uh, conviction of the relevance of it, even if it just was for like a personal mental state. That's what I can say about that. I became obsessed with all the fences and barriers that are going up and yeah, those have come in. Like I don't know, like, like all these goddamn fences. <laughs> you know, and tape and fence and another fence and a plastic fence and a metal fence. And, yeah. So I know what you mean, yeah. So just to recapitulate, the question from the audience was that in the first question that I posed was, why are we still painting? And um, the remark from the audience came that it was mainly focused on um, personal issues in the studio, but that wasn't really a link in what happened in the real world, like for example, the COVID crisis. So do you feel that that question is answered? Not 
really because I, for me personally, it was like a big issue that you start questioning more your practice and, and when you see there's more important things going on, that I want to hear that uh, if, if you dealt with those things a bit, because, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there you can. And yeah, it was just funny that because the title of the show, I loved that this talk, I thought it was really focused on during this time, the, the changes that has happened. Mm -hmm. And it felt like everything that was said was just yeah, totally not talking about that. And it was, yeah. Oh, no. Maybe you could formulate it slightly different, like in a way, like if there's anybody in this whole room that actually think thinking is irrelevant, or because I know, I think everybody's, I, I don't know, is in arts in some way and related to it. It's quite obvious that painting is relevant, but uh, it could be interesting to like put a you know, plumber on the table or somebody who has mm -hmm. a painting plays no role in their life. Mm -hmm. Irrelevant so, uh, for who? But what? Irrelevant for who or what? Or yeah. the answer so the your question is very based on. Like, you say, like, okay, what has, why are we still painting? Like, for the world, is that the your question? I, I feel like, mm -hmm. or like, how does it go outside of this artistic content? Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Are there but, are there people that have sort of solved that before for you? Sorry? Are there people that have like solved that for you well in the past? Other artists who have solved the who like represent a good that have an actual. Um, well, just to refocus a bit, the question coming from the audience was, is there anyone opposed to the question, why are we still painting? Uh, oh. no, not, opposed to, sorry, not opposed to the question, but I mean to the idea of the relevance of painting. That's what you're saying, and uh, I can Did honestly answer that uh, I am. You're saying. opposed to the relevance of painting? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> I'm opposed to that, and that's why I'm. That, that's why I was asking the question. Yeah. Uh, so there is someone in this room that really is opposed to that. So, but yeah. Speaking of that, speaking of what Melissa was saying when she was uh, putting a gown and talking about uh, the gag, and then you mentioned yourself the notion of muteness in painting, and you were forever using spoken language and written language to try to talk about painting. That's the only way that's possible. And now that a new word comes up, like in this about for all book, you have the, the notion of volition, and then, and then that opens up a whole new kind of like way of considering what is, what is done. And then I was thinking when you were talking about, you mentioned gesture, that's a, at some point you give me an explanation of what you meant by that, and I was thinking of this term that's used for, it's maybe, Used, we're maybe kind of conscious of it in terms of medicine, it's this word metastasis, uh, but it's actually also used in, to, to consider rhetoric. Um, what's nice about it is, or what's interesting about it is, to me, is that it's, it's how you move around something, and how you might move around in spoken language, because you might move around quickly and nimbly, so that the attention isn't drawn to something that you've just said. So you move on to something like that. And I often think about that when I'm looking at painting. It's like, where is the person moving me along here? What do they not want me to see? How are they controlling it? And I think it's often kind of like a, not a conflict, but it's like a, a struggle or a tension between where the, where the person who's making the work is wanting to draw your attention to or away from and moving you around. And, and a, a kind of like a, I mean, my own part, a reluctance to let that happen. Mm -hmm. you know, this is how I'm talking now about a, a, an, an experience uh, of painting with regards to just leading off from this thought of the gag to consider other ways in which we experience painting in relationship to the person who has made it. Do I need to make a question out of that? <laughs> no. No. I put a I think about what I think of else was. I think what? I think about how you how you how you move the speed with which you move somebody along in terms of like the the, the first take and then the second take. And how you and how what you're dealing with the subject matter 
uh, is in relationship to how much time hmm. it feels like it's being spent and, and volition exerted. And that, the ratio is really you know, quite crucial. Isn't it? Yeah. More or less statement, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Totally fine. Let's maybe move on to the last question. Okay, um, yeah, and the question is, is a bit of, um, okay, we kind of understand the, the kind of disappointment um, Philip was trying to express also with uh, the answers that were given to the, the question, the central question of his, of his talk. Um, uh, thanks for your contributions, I really appreciate it. Um, but I think it's too easy to get away with this. You as painters with a capital P, right? Um, Painting has been declared dead on several occasions. Right? It's been resurrected as zombie formalism, more recently as zombie figuration. Huh? Um, so the question is how do we move on from there? Um, we are here, 2021, still talking about painting, still talking about slowness, the studio, etc. My suggestion would be to talk about the post-studio practice. Think of Daniel Bevent, for instance. We're talking about decades ago, right? When we're talking about painting, I would suggest to replace it with the painter leading, much more interesting. And then let's have another round of, of discussion, you know, another hour or two. Because I feel like nothing is really happening in painting. I, mean, kind of, does, does it even, I know it's slow, but it's a bit too slow. Does something ever happen in painting? Or is it just like, or, am I looking at the bottom of that, really? Am I looking at something? Yeah. Okay. What is happening in painting? I'm, I'm asking you. It's really, it's really honest question. Yeah. I keep on hearing the same fucking stories. You know, like painting has been declared dead, it's been resurrected. I mean, there's a studio. My God, the studio. Does painting also happen outside of the studio? Yeah. I think so, it's also. It depends on how you see a painting. Is it just to get an image or do you, like, uh, what is, uh, is a painting necessarily a uh, thing on a canvas or surface, it's also just like what, like how, how you look at things and the painting has a function I think yeah? yes, of course, it's a I also actually agree on that, and when I was thinking beforehand, like, uh, ah, why are we still painting? And then I was really thinking, like, when have we not been doing that? And also, like, we have kids, and what do we occupy our kids with? Like, oh, uh, what is the creative? Like, what is the first basic creativity of? Uh, uh, upbringing of a child, you give him a paper and you give him a pen, like, uh, or, you know, it's just so, it's not even, it's, I don't know, and then some people go be, become artists and make, like, uh, painting and that, but still, like, yeah, it's really primitive, like, uh, the cave painting, draw. I don't know, it's like, why are we still painting, it's like. I would actually like to reply to Peter, and like sometimes I also question myself what's next, but I think it's quite hard to like because the thing is we're in the same context, we're still in the same paradigm, and if you look at like certain like frictions that that happen, we're responsible on stuff, and I kind of feel like if you look at like where art is going now, that you kind of are actually a bit where Danto said it, like art after the end of art, and we're there, and it's kind of hard to answer on what your question is because you can't really think outside of the frame. And I think we're still in the frame, in a way. You mean the, the, the sense, uh, I mean, that can be yeah, a play of own words within the painterly yeah, sense, but uh, I, I think it's, I know sometimes I also have that thing. And I, I know sometimes I don't think that yeah. the biggest revelations within the spectrum of painting can yeah. happen. Also, like, oh, I'd be so sad if, like, the painters that I like sort of answered this. Mm -hmm. Like, it'd be like, like, imagine going to Kelly James Marshall, like, what, what do you think now? Like, come on, man. 
update it, it's like, oh, but I think he had a, like, I mean, obviously he's been doing this for like years and years and years, you know? And it comes out of like a really long, but it's so relevant, you know? And then, but was it relevant when he first started doing it? I don't know. And then, I don't know. And then actually, I think that's what I mean is I think like sometimes people do stuff for years and years and nobody's paying attention and then all of a sudden it becomes relevant and I think they have been living in the world, you know? I understand what you mean, yeah. I mean to come back also to the, the question that Philip formulated, like, if you ask about the, the raison d'etre of painting, is painting really about painting or can it also be related to something outside of the frame? Well, that's exactly yeah, the Jan Verwoerd yeah, essay yeah, talks the, about. Yeah, that's the Jan Verwoerd essay, yeah. Yeah, exactly, I read it. That was actually implied in the first question a bit, what you're saying now. Because I wanted to say it also depends a bit on what you're trying to tackle as an artist, I think. So the question of, like, for me, yeah. um, something like a corona crisis didn't, like, directly affect my work. Mm. And that has something to do, I think, with what kind of work you make or what's your intention as an artist. So. Um, I think for some artists uh, who are more responsive, it would like immediately intrude the practice. But I think that's something you can't like, take for granted. Like, can't ask for every artist. I mean, so I think so, some artists play on on other levels. I understand that. I know you and that's why I was also trying to ask the question: Is we still call it painting? I know your work, mm -hmm. so I will call it painter B. Maybe? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So that's, but that's an interesting. Yeah, and that's a. Because, yeah. yeah the story of the installation in, in, uh, installations in Venice, of like sculptures in Venice, it's like, which is so called painting, but it's not a canvas, it's not a flat surface, it's not medium specific. Mm -hmm. It leaves its own domain. Of course, we didn't. Yeah. We only have an hour, but like yeah. what you're suggesting now is, is also something I, I, I couldn't tackle tonight, but. Um, it's still a proposal that it's painting. I mean, yeah. I think if you paint today, you always make a proposal to look at it as a painting. I think you can't yeah. get out of that anymore. So mm -hmm. what you say about the painterly, I, I, I totally agree on that. So, um, but I think I think I I did at the beginning. I really do believe like that. There are probably other motivations, but I think one motivation that exists right now is like pure self pleasure. And then to like send it into the world and hope people like it. Like that, I really think that that's happening. I think it always starts. Yeah, with totally. And then I think there are. Yeah, I, I'm not saying it's a bad thing at all. I really think, and then I think that some people are really struggling with history. You know, I think that there's like a really like there's why painting now because we're reevaluating history, like because history because history is changing because there's a total reevaluation of who gets to speak what position, what identities, like, and that's like, to me, a pretty amazing motivation for painting. And then I think there's people that like, I really do believe that like, there's some people that like, there's no making sense of it. And to me, I'm interested in that. Like, like I can't make sense of it. And that's interesting for me. But then I think there's other things going on. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that that's definitive, but from my perspective, that's, I think, three motivations why people are still painting. <laughs> I mean, my question was more because I was just amazed that you know, you brought up like you did the picture and I just wanted to hear like these personal stories mm -hmm. during those times. It was not like oh you don't care about this. It was more I was just amazed that you didn't I didn't, didn't see it because you were talking about it. Because that, that was my main idea mm -hmm. with the title was like, oh, it's gonna be about that. Mm -hmm. And how it went to somewhere else it's like wow these people must be doing what they do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just, yeah, I want to take it like small. No, no, but I think it's a, actually a good question. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, increased migraines due to computer time, mm -hmm. lack of daycare, um, you know, so Just of to like, sum up this last question that was yeah. posed from, from the audience was that, like, um, um, what is happening in painting? That was the question, I guess. Um, talking about. Um, the, because this evening there was a lot of talk about this uh, studio-based practice, um, but from the audience the, the question came that we should talk about this post-studio practice maybe. So 
um, and the, the raison d'être of, of like painting. So do you feel in any way that this question is answered? <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's con conclude our evening here. Yeah. Um, thank you to the four of you, uh, Mathieu, Melissa, Nikhil, Johan. Um, thank you to the audience also. Um, so one last round of applause.